Yeah, yeah, def, uh, make you uh, uh, share your screen. So my screen is being shared, okay? So I passed the four to our def. Okay, sorry, I wasn't too sure. So hopefully um, you can hear me okay. Um, if you can't hear me, I'm hopefully you'll tell me. Um, hi, um, welcome. My name is Dave Glover and I'm uh, what's known as a cloud developer advocate. Uh, I work for Microsoft and I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, I have a, a pretty much a focus on the internet of things. And within that, I do a lot of Python, um, a lot of C and a lot of C sharp. Those are kind of the languages uh, that I tend to specialize in. And oops, hang on a second. Yeah, sorry. Um, just the, uh, the screen's not quite as I expected. It. Um, so um, what I'm going to cover off here in this session, so this session is going to be a bit about uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, I suspect a lot of people are already using it. So I'm just going to go through a few tricks and tips that I've kind of learned um, to pull together for this session. Um, if you're not using Visual Studio Code at the moment, um, you, or you don't, you're not familiar with it, it's an open source, um, lightweight, cross platforms, you can run it on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and it has an, extens an extensibility model. So you can plug in lots of different extensions. And one of the most popular extensions uh, for Visual Studio Code is the Python extension. And I'm going to kind of talk through some of those things um, that you can actually do. Uh, with the Python extension. Um, so just to kind of give you a bit of a sense of where the Python extension started off, it actually started off as a, a pet project back in 2016, and then was actually acquired by Microsoft in 2017. And today it stands in something like 27 million times it's been downloaded. Um, so it's an extremely popular uh, extension for Visual Studio Code. And it's got a lot of features in there. So it's got things like IntelliSense, um, in fact, we're using uh, machine learning models nowadays uh, to help um, improve productivity uh, with things like IntelliSense. So there's great support in there. Um, there's support in there for Jupyter Notebooks, uh, debugging, environment handling, testing, linting, formatting, all those types of things. Um, and there are lots of different extensions uh, that are available that you can be plugging in uh, to be able to go and uh, be productive with Python. Okay, so the, the agenda that I'm going to be kind of covering, so um, so it's Visual Studio Code and tricks and tips and tricks. And I'm going to look at a few things, and we've actually got uh, an opportunity for you to participate in one of the demos as well. Um, and as we go through that demo, and I'll show you kind of how that will work. Uh, so we're going to look at VS Code and something called remote SSH debugging. Now, I'm going to show this in the context of a Raspberry Pi, but this could be any kind of remote debugging. So where you can be potentially connecting into a container that's in the cloud, for example, or on-premise or somewhere in, inside your organization, and you want to be able to connect into it and really seamlessly be able to work on Python projects. Um, I'm going to talk about something uh, which is pretty brand new, which is around debugging uh, web apps and what we call live refresh. And it's pretty neat. Um, I'm, the example I'm going to show you is around Flask apps. And you can do a lot. And, and it's really about improving your productivity. Um, the next thing I want to talk about after that is Visual Studio Code and remote container development. Um, now, the whole concept behind remote container development is the idea that you can kind of give out a standard package uh, to all the devs in your organization or in your school or your university or your coding club or whatever it might be they can basically start up Visual Studio Code and with Docker installed, it would automatically create the environment that you want for them to be created. So that's pretty neat. I'm gonna show um, some stuff that you can do around Jupyter Notebook debugging. And the last one, depending on how you go for time, I'm gonna show you something called Circuit Express Simulator. Alrighty, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is this thing called VS Code Remote SSH Development. 
And the whole idea and what's going on is effectively Visual Studio Code has been split into two parts. We've kind of got the, the, the UI side, the, the, the bit that you interact with, that you run on your desktop. And then you can have on a remote machine, the VS Code remote server. And that basically, that remote server kind of operates on behalf of the client or the VS Code. And we're gonna go see this in action. So we're gonna do a bit of a demo. Now, um, while I start up that demo, uh, if you wanna go and click on that link, oh, sorry, you can't click on that link. Um, if you type in that link, so it's aka.ms slash um, Python Rover. So aka.ms slash Python Rover. And click on that link and uh, and then we'll start the demo and you can participate at the demo. That's the kind of idea. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you how you can control a robot in this case, it's a little Rover robot. So aka.ms slash Python Rover. And hopefully at least some of you are gonna click on that. Otherwise I'll be clicking on it. Alrighty, and so the way that this demo is gonna work um, in fact, no, I'm going to show the demo first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up a, uh, a new instance of Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code here. And I've installed as an extension what are called Visual Studio Code Remote uh, Development Extensions. And as part of that, you get these options. So what I did there is just clicked on the bottom left-hand corner. And I'm going to connect to Remote SSH Host. Now, I've already pre-configured a set of hosts that I've got, and I've kind of set up the SSH uh, security uh, for that. So what it's done is you see down the bottom left hand corner, it's connecting to a remote device. So in this case, you can see I've connected to something called PyLab and the user is Pi. And what I can do now is I can open a folder and you see what I'm doing is I'm actually navigating the file system on the Raspberry Pi, which is which is uh, running that robot. And I'm gonna to go to GitHub. And in that directory there, there is a project called Raspberry Pi Python server. I'm gonna open that up. So you remember, even though it looks like I'm doing all this on Windows, this is all running in the context of um, the Raspberry Pi. And it just gives us a moment to load up. So we see it's loaded up. And if I go F5 and if at least somebody could click on that link and you can go and click on that link and make it go left and right. So hopefully, yeah, hey, okay. Now what I'm gonna do is if someone, someone just going, yeah, cool. So you can see that just with clicking on that, you're sending a message through um, to that bot. And so that's the bot that we got there and we'll, we'll see this. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a breakpoint. And I'm gonna put a breakpoint just in this code here. And in fact, that's now gonna be, okay, well, that's fine. You can hear it running in the background. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step through this code and you better see some of the things. So what's come down is a JSON payload and the last, last uh, thing was the last uh, direction was to go forward. I'm going to step through this, step through this code. So remember, this is all running on the Raspberry Pi. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here into the debugger window. So you'll see it in the debugger window. And what I'm going to do is change this to be stop. Okay. So I'm going to move through there. And I'm going to step into this code, and you just see, I'm just setting up a switcher up here, kind of like a case study a switch statement. Go through there, and then we'll step into the function, and you'll see ah that that didn't work. Oh. Can I get somebody to go and hit stop? <laughs> Alrighty, cool. Someone hit stop. Okay, so you can see the idea there. So what's going on? You've been able to interact with that page, and and what's happening, of course, behind the scenes, and I'm going to explain how that's working in a moment, is a message has been sent to the device, and in which case you can control the motors left and right and make it go forward and backwards and things like that. So it's pretty neat. And you can just step through that. And again, you should be able to make sure I've got the right window up. Yep. And we'll just step through this again. And for hover over this, 
you'll see it's now someone's put it into to make it go um, uh, right, uh, to make it go uh, right forward. Um, before I jump in there, what I wanted to show is that sometimes it's not always immediately apparent. What I've just done then is clicked on this debug console. And just so you know that there is an, also an, an opportunity for interactive um, debugging or interactive execution of code. So in this case here, what I'm just going to do is print um, direction. And you'll see up here, it's got um, right forward. And what I could do is I could just say direction equals, and I'm just going to say uh, stop. And if I go up here and we do direction print, you'll see it's now stop. So despite somebody putting in right forward, I've actually just kind of overridden that. And you'll see that has actually, I should have put a breakpoint in there. Uh, well, that will go up just up here and we'll put a breakpoint and stop. Um, and we just step through this code again. Bang, bang, bang. And hopefully you get the idea that, okay, that that's someone's put that into, into forward mode. No, into turning left. Okay, anyway, um, I hope you kind of got the idea. So it's pretty neat what you can do with um, Python and without too much code. Now, all this code is sitting up uh, on my GitHub. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set that to stop again because that's the end of that demo. Otherwise, it'll be uh, running in the background the whole time. Okay, so that was remote SSH development. Now, I've obviously shown you kind of like a funsy example. Um, you might be doing uh, Raspberry Pi development, but almost certainly you are going to be wanting to be able to SSH into a container somewhere or into a service somewhere on the web, and you can use that um, to, to use as a pretty neat technique to connect in. Okay, so the way that's actually working is I was using, oh, let me just switch over to my slides. Right, okay. So the way this is working, obviously you saw um, there was a code running on the, the Python code running on the Raspberry Pi. And I had a, I had a web page uh, that was being fed from Azure Static Storage. So it's completely serverless based application. What that was doing is that that was calling a Python based Azure function that's living up in Azure. And Azure is kind of uh, functions as serverless. You just pay for what you need. You don't have to worry about any infrastructure. You just deploy them and they change the code they'll execute. And then what that function was doing is it was talking to IoT Hub. And then with an IoT Hub, it, what it said, I want IoT Hub to go and send what's called a direct method um, to the device. And then what happens if the device picks it up, and obviously you saw it picked up the payload, go forward, go back, stop, things like that. And you can kind of see how that, that works. And to kind of give you a bit of a sense of this, so I just switch back to my desktop again. I'll just go into the um, Visual Studio and into the Rover. And I said, all this code uh, lives up in my GitHub, and I'll show you where that all, uh, with the links to that at the end of the session. Alrighty, so this is the function um, that I wrote um, to control. So that web page is a bit of JavaScript on that. And all that JavaScript is doing is doing an HTTP get. Um, and it's calling this function. And this function is what's called an HTTP trigger. It's going to trigger. And then on that, on that HTTP get that's been issued from that JavaScript page, um, I pick up a command. And the command is forward, backwards, you know, turn in a circle, et cetera. So that's how a function works. So you can write those in Python as well. And you can also debug them as well, uh, but I'm not gonna show that because I've got a whole lot more I wanna show. Alrighty. Okay, so that's um, the, the first thing you can do there. And just, I kind of mentioned that the uh, Azure functions, you can write them in multiple languages. You can write them in Java, C Sharp, Python, uh, Node, um, so you can write functions in lots of different languages. And the beauty of them is they're super cheap to run. Uh, you basically, you could, I could run that uh, service a, about a million times over a month and it wouldn't cost me anything. Um, but of course it scales on demand and you don't have to worry about infrastructure. That all gets managed for you. Okay. And that's the Python function which I showed you. Alrighty, so the next thing I want to show is um, debugging web apps and with live refresh. So this is something new and um, it's just been, been released. 
uh, over about two weeks ago. Now, the way that I'm going to do this demo is I'm going to do this on VS Code on ARM64. So um, again, you might have, you kind of probably give you a bit of a flow on this. Don't worry, it's not all devices, but um, but ARM64 is kind of interesting. And then we've now uh, finally released uh, a native version of the ARM64. So you can run ARM64 on Raspberry Pi in this case, or ARM32 uh, on, on a smaller Raspberry Pi, an earlier Raspberry Pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remote um, RDP into um, a Raspberry Pi that I have uh, sitting next to me. I'm just going to remember what my password is. Okay. Alrighty. So what I've done is I've remoted into a Raspberry Pi. So these are this is a Raspberry Pi version four, and Raspberry Pi version fours are getting extremely capable. Uh, so you're going to see this now that, and the reason I'm kind of showing this is that um, uh, so is if you're running a school or a university or things like that, or you've got children at home who want to be able to play around with us with these technologies and learn about coding, the Raspberry Pi version fours are getting extremely capable. Um, whoops, I don't think I'm showing up my desktop. I'm sorry. Sorry, I had my wrong um, uh, screen share out. So what I've done, what you didn't see me do, but is I just basically remoted into this um, into this desktop. So I've come into the Raspberry into this Raspberry Pi, and you can see I'm running something called Raspberry Pi Mate. It's an it's a flavor of Ubuntu that's quite popular, and it runs very well on the Raspberry Pi. And as I sort of touched upon a moment ago, if you've got kids at home or um, um, or university, whatever it is. Um, this is a great platform for you to go and build things on. In fact, Raspberry Pi just released their new Pi 400, which is a, basically a keyboard with a Raspberry Pi built onto it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up uh, this project, and I've got something in here called Debug Flask, and I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code. So you remember how I said now we've got full 64-bit um, support um, for, um, for Visual Studio Code. And what this is doing is just loading up. It's a little bit slow on the desktop, but not, um, not woefully slow. And what I'm going to do is just press F5 um, to start that up. And what that's going to do is going to launch um, the browser. I think it launches up Firefox. OK, so it's launched up Firefox. And what it's done here is just reported on the CPU temperature. In fact, what I'm going to do is just move that over. So you can see both Visual Studio Code and the CPU and the uh, browser on one page. And I just want to show you some things that are kind of interesting. In fact, one of the things I want to show is I actually, when I was just going through this demo before, I, I commented some code out. So what I'm going to do is just uncomment that code, press save. Now you'll notice that I've got the debug session still open. And this is the really neat thing. If I go again and hit refresh, you'll see that the page is refreshed, but I haven't had to restart the debugger. So that's something that's pretty neat and, and uh, new that's just come out for the, uh, the Python extension. Now, as you'd expect, what I can do is I can go and set uh, breakpoints. And then the other thing that's really neat, so this is a Flask app. So hopefully you have some familiarity with Flask. What I can do as well is I can set breakpoints in the Flask template. And you'll see in this place here, I've got a placeholder for, in this case, it's for image. And uh, we're just going to fire this up. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to refresh. So remember, I don't have to stop the debugger. And in this case, I'm just going to change in here. I'm just going to put in um, Hong Kong. We just save that. And that's restarted the debugger. Oops, sorry. And we'll just refresh that. And run through that, and then we've now so, you, so we've now hit the breakpoint inside the uh, Flask template, and you can see over there I can hover over that, and that's all good, and I can keep going through that code. And in fact, another one I just played around with is what I'm going to do is I'm just got um, another um, some code I'm just going to uncomment, which is just going to put the logo for PyCon in there, and I'm going to come back over to my app. Uh, page. I'm just going to change from logo uh, none to logo in the PyCon logo. And I'll do a refresh on that. 
just get through the debugger and voila. So that's one of the really neat things that's just come out with um, the latest release of the Python extension is this live refresh. And the other thing I want to kind of get across is like the, you can do some amazing things now on these platforms like Raspberry Pi. So just want to kind of get those across. Alrighty, so the next thing I want to talk about is what you can do around Visual Studio Code and remote container development. So remote container development is a bit like SSH. So remember I said the yeah, Visual Studio, uh, whoops, I need to, hopefully if I got my right screen. Sorry about that, I'm trying to make sure I switch screens. So you remember I said with, um, with remote SSH, we have the uh, Visual Studio is effectively split up into two parts. We've got the UI on the desktop, and then we've got SSH in that case, running on a device or in a container somewhere in the cloud. Now, remote container development is kind of interesting because it takes that same model, but instead what you're gonna do is you're gonna remote into a container. And the beauty of this is that you can then set up these standardized um, containers on, on inside your organization or university or school or, or home, or whatever it is. And then you can start um, uh, developing in the, against this. Oops, I'm not sure why one drives come up. Oops, I'm not sure why it doesn't want to go away. All right, cool. Okay, so what I've got here is another project which is called Flash App in the Container. And I'm going to open that inside of Visual Studio Code. And in a moment, you'll see in the bottom right hand corner, what is going to pop up is this here option to say, do I want to reopen in a container? So what's going to happen is that this, this application, so Visual Studio Code and this extension is going to um, if the container doesn't live on my desktop, it'll pull that container down or build that container on my desk. But the beauty of it is that I then have a standardized desktop. And if I just close this down, and the way that gets defined is there's a special folder here called dot, um, dot .dev container. And inside that, you'll see that there's a JSON document, which basically describes things like, hey, look, I want these extensions to be installed. So you can imagine if you want to send it out to a whole lot of people, hey, look, I want you to all using the same version of these extensions, uh, various libraries, then you can go and set this up. And you can go and say, hey, look, what version of Python do you want? Look, I want everybody to be running, uh, building this application in Python 3.8 or 3.9 or 3.6, whatever it is that you're building the application in. And then you can look in your Docker file and you'll see again, there's the option in here to go and uh, specify what version of Python is. So hopefully you kind of get the idea that the beauty of this is you go and bundle everything up is just how you want it inside your organization or, or wherever you're using this. Deploy that out onto each one's desktop. They have to have Docker installed. They then basically open up that project and magically it just all starts up. And if I go and look into, um, look at my system, if I just go and look at Docker, and you'll see um, that there is a container running, and this is the Visual Studio Code Flash app container. So that's been automatically started up for me. And if I go across to the app file, and this is just the same demo as the one I just showed you running on ARM64 on, on the Raspberry Pi. And what this is going to do is that that automatically fired up this app. And again, exactly the same process I showed you before, uh, this, except this is now all running on my desktop. I can go and put in a breakpoint. I just can put a breakpoint in there. And we can step through that. And you've kind of got this developer environment and you've kind of got all this thing I showed you before about being able to update data on the fly without having to restart the debugger environment or things like that. If I go hit, hit run, on that and you'll see what I do in the system here. I just generate some random data over here. And again, this demo is sitting up on my GitHub as well. So remote containers is a really neat way of being able to deploy out something standard or get started with something. And in fact, if you look at the tutorials and I've got links to this in the end, 
um, there's some really nice get started ones. And then you can say, hey, look, I want to get started with Python or Node or C++ or whatever it is. Um, the containers out there for all of these things. Alrighty. Hopefully this time I'm going to remember to switch back to the slides. Okay, so then it's remote uh, container development. So you can do a lot there. Right, the next thing I want to talk about is what you can do around Jupyter Notebooks development and just give you a sense of what you can do there. And so inside the Visual Studio Code extension, there is again support for um, Visual, uh, so for uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, I'm going to go over here to a folder. And I've got a folder over here called Jupyter Notebook. And I'm going to open it with code. And what I'm going to do, because I've actually got uh, on Windows 10, I'm using something called WSL for Windows uh, subsystem for Linux. I'm actually going to reopen this solution in the Linux subsystem on my desktop. So you can see there's an option up here called reopen folder in WSL. Okay, and the reason I've done that is, um, interesting enough, there's an issue with NumPy on Windows 10 at the moment, um, but it all works just, just fine in Linux. So I thought I would just do it in Linux, and hey, this is a good way you can see stuff working in Linux as well. So what I've done is I actually, and you see there's as an, an Iron Python file, so I've exported this out from a, um, a Jupyter notebook, and I just downloaded it, and this is what's, what's going on. And so what you can do now within this is you can actually step through this. Um, obviously, cool, you can do that with inside a Jupyter book, but I'm going to show you a few tips and tricks. Um, so this is setting up the requirements. And then we just set up uh, table name configuration. And then something that's new inside this is this thing called run by line. So I'm going to click on that little icon. And you'll see that I've now got um, the the, uh, the, the highlighter. Now, this is not a debugger as such, but it's a really useful way. And you might have spotted or hover over that. Um, you can go and do F10 and you can step through that code. And so it's quite a nice way because it, often when you're looking at Jupyter Notebooks, you think, I know there's something wrong in here. I just can't quite figure out what's going on. And you'll see up the top here, there's also a variables table. Um, and you can go and look. So it provides, rather than having to go and put print line, excuse me, all the way through your Jupyter Notebooks, which we all kind of end up doing, um, this gives you a way in which you can kind of get a much better view. Now, and that kind of just, that did a, um, a plot, that plot lib. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a, um, a bug in this. I'm gonna change tag name just to be tag. And now what I'm gonna do, I'll just make sure that's saved, is I'm gonna do an export and what it's done now is it's exported it out. So I've got a, effectively a, a script and I can run this. So you can see I can run each cell. So the first thing it's gonna do is gonna start up um, Jupyter Notebook instance and I can step through this. Now, what I was wanting to show is I'm gonna put a breakpoint down here and I'm gonna run the cell. That cell, step through my code and right. Okay, and I'm gonna to get to this one. And didn't quite do something. She probably should have pressed and I didn't I didn't do that quite right. What I should have done was pressed F5, I think. Whoop. No. Okay, sorry, I've slightly mucked that demo up. But what I should have done is I should have saved it. Um, but because I'm running a bit tight on time, um, and what they would have done is it would have broken it at that break point. And then I could have stepped into it. And I actually use this in real life because I had a, a data schema that changed inside the database that I was getting at and things broke. And it was a really useful way to figure out what was going on. Alrighty, so I've got one last demo and then I'm out of here. So we just switch back to the slides and come back over here. Um, so that's that's um, Jupyter Notebook debugging. So that's again, part of the standard Python extension. Alrighty, so the next part I'm gonna show is what you can do around devices. 
Now, again, if you've got kids at home or uh, and you want to be able to teach them a bit about Internet of Things and maker stuff and stuff like that, um, super, super useful way to kind of get um, kids up and running or yourself for that matter, up and running. And there's some steps here. Look, if, if people can play around with devices, make it more real, more tangible, um, then um, the kids often like that. Alrighty, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this project here inside Visual Studio code, and I'm going to reopen it inside WSL, so my Linux subsystem. And what I'm going to do is press F1, and I'm going to open a simulator. And you'll see there's various simulators in here. There's possibly ones you might have seen before. So this is a this is the um, BBC Microbit. Um, I'm going to use the, what's called the Clue. It's a new one from um, uh, Name Escapes Me, uh, Adafruit. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to press F5. Press F5, run that in the simulator. And then what I can do is I can now step through this code, which is effectively running in the context of the simulator. And you'll see that I'm putting uh, that, you know, as you can see, I should be able to hover over these things and step through this code. And I'll put a breakpoint down here because I know it's going to do a show down the end. And if I do a show over that, you'll see. Some strange reason it's decided it's not going to do it for me. And so someone did say this, it can be a problem. Let me try, I'll give it one, one more go, uh, particularly when you're sharing out your screen apparently, because of course it worked just perfectly before. So we'll do that and then we'll go um, F5. Run the simulator. Of course, it's now going to decide now is the perfect time to play up. Okay, all righty. I'm not entirely sure. Um, what I've been told is when you're presenting it, um, this simulator can put, uh, play up um, over when you're presenting over um, a remote um, preview. Anyway, hope you got the idea there. So this is called a uh, circuit, um, a circuit express uh, device emulator. And again, it's pretty neat with what you can do. Alrighty, so I am pretty much out of time. So I'll just quickly finish, uh, finish the slides. Jump back over to slides view and we'll just go through the rest of that. So I've just shown that demo. Right, so you might want to take a screenshot of this. Um, so this is, these are the resources. So you'll find that there is, um, if you're not familiar with Microsoft Learn, um, we have some amazing resources up there for Python. And so do check out that one called akv.ms slash pycon dash learn. And what I've done is basically went through all those modules and figured out ones I thought would be super useful. Um, check out Microsoft Docs so you can learn more about Python based Azure functions and stuff like that. And the, and the resources that are related to this talk will be in this location here called pycon um, dash HK Hong Kong, November 2020. And go, you'll go to that link. I mean, actually, it's not populated yet, but it will be populated very soon. And I'm just going to put in some additional links. Now, while I'm here, in fact, I'm just going to switch back to my desktop. And then, I don't know, I'm going to the time. Just so you know uh, where this code, I run a GitHub called Gloveboxes. So my name is Dave Glover. And Glovebox is, is a nice, easy way to remember that. So go to github.com slash Gloveboxes and to the repository there. And you'll see that this is the repo with all those demos that I showed you. So the remote containers, the, the, the Jupyter notebooks, uh, the Rover, uh, as well as the, um, the, ja the JavaScript for that, everything there that you'll need uh, for that demo. So on that note, I am, I think, a couple minutes over, over time. So Hopefully um, you enjoyed that. And if you've got a couple of questions, then please go for it.
friends, Dave. May I ask the participants any questions? So we can have uh, one uh, quick questions before we start the next uh, sessions. Yeah. So we will, we have uh, one question from the chat room from Starpoon. Is this ah. possible to do a remote debugging on remote Jupyter servers on KS inside? Yes. Our so the answer, the answer is yes. So you can connect um, in, inside um, Jupyter. There is the ability to go and select local and room. Ah, sorry, hang on, let me just share my screen. So you see what I, so I'm inside Visual Studio Code. I just pressed F1, I typed in Jupyter. And you'll see down here, you can specify local or remote Jupyter server for connections. So awesome question, yes, you can. Um, then you've kind of got all the complexity, of course, of Kubernetes. Um, but Kubernetes tends to sort that out for one instance that you're going to connect to. So the answer is you can do that. Um, yes. And the awesome question. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks, Dev. Uh, uh, any other questions? Any other quick questions? All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of PyCon. I um, suspect so you've got a, a busy uh, amount of time, lots, lots to learn. So, thank you very much for uh, joining, and I'll hand back to the um, PyCon Hong Kong people. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. So next sessions will be uh, uh, data wish content management with Django CMS and Django uh, West framework by Danny Wolf from Covert Health, one of our sponsor as well. Thanks, I uh, appreciate the introduction. I hope it's not too loud out here. Um, I am sitting outside my office because don't want to bother my colleagues. Uh, do you think you can allow me to share my screen? Yeah, uh, this way. Okay. Oh, right. Okay, you can start share your your screen. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I hope everybody can see my slides. Yeah. All right. So let me get started here. So, hi everybody. My name is Danny. I'm a software engineer at Clover Health. It's a pleasure to speak to everybody today, and hopefully, I can give some insight on some of the more interesting things we do here at Clover Health and how we use Python to solve really complex healthcare issues in the United States. Right. So today, I'm going to give everybody here a window into what working as a software engineer in health tech may kind of look like. So we'll go over a bit about me, my journey here, an overview of Clover, how Clover uses Python to literally save lives. Um, I'll focus in on one of more, our more edge cases of how we use Python and how that might relate to you and all your companies. Uh, we'll talk about Django CMS to create self-managing websites with flexible and yet powerful plugins at the same time. So who am I? I am just a humble guy from Indiana, USA, who just voted for Trump, unfortunately. <laughs> um, or fortunately, if that's, that's the way you roll. I went there to study medicine, decided against being a doctor, worked in emergency medicine for a while uh, in an ambulance, switched from IU School of Medicine over to the School of Engineering, uh, but still wanted to do healthcare somehow. So moved to Hong Kong, joined Clover Health, and yeah, I got really lucky. Instead of saving lives one by one on an ambulance, I got to work with Clover to save lives uh, at scale. So who are we? We're a US-based company with roots from Silicon Valley and a growing technical wing out here in Hong Kong. We are growing rapidly. I was the fourth employee hired here last July. 
and now we're up to 22 and we're still growing. Uh, this is us in our Xiang Wan offices uh, a couple weeks ago. We're a fun bunch and a lot of us are here on the call as well, I think. So uh, what is Clover? We're literally a health insurance company. Uh, the thing is we do Medicare Advantage, which means our business model is actually very different from traditional insurance. So we've made the waves in the news a few times in the last couple months when we announced our partnership with Walmart. Uh, Walmart is a famous <laughs> store in the U United States. They're known for like good deals. They sell everything from prescriptions to toilet paper to groceries. Um, so we're launching a co-branded plan with them. And we also recently announced our deal to go public uh, through a merger with Social Capital. So what did I mean when I said we're, our business model isn't like regular insurance? So in the US, when someone turns 65, they get something that's called Medicare, which is where the government will pay for all of your health expenses. And so seniors will get sick more easily, unfortunately. So this can get quite expensive. Um, in Medicare Advantage, which is another layer on top of Medicare, uh, the government pays us for what they think the member will cost and then we pay for all of their actual costs. So in other words, the US government pays us like a set dollar amount per patient, and then we handle all of that risk. So this creates quite a mutually beneficial alignment of incentives between the insurance company and the member that you really don't find anywhere else. So if you consider like a member's health expense or like their cost curve, which is what, you know, what looks like on the left. So if you shift that cost curve to the left by improving health outcomes, to like to something to like the right, this is like the main driver of our profit margin. So basically we get like a set amount of money for our members. If we keep them healthy, they win and we and, and we also win. That, that green line and red line gap that we see there, that's, that's all profit if we can shift everything to the left. So how do we shift everything to the left? We use data, we use uh, machine learning, and we use all sorts of clinical care activists to make sure our members stay healthy and thus lowering costs. Uh, and of course, we use te technology to do that. You know, so, so what is this technology? Um, our main technologies that we use are called health interventions. So we use health interventions to try to manage our population health. So these are run through several different types of channels. So for example, we have medication adherence, which means we make sure our patients continue to take their medications cancer screenings to detect cancer before it happens, chronic disease management, and complex conditions management. So we have like, we have direct to member interventions, like member calls. So here's an example of what one of you might see if you look at uh, our, our call center agents might see when they pull up a member. So in real time, we would populate demographics, contact information, their medical history with us. And to the right over there, you'll see uh, we have a list of interventions in the call to-do list. So another category of channels, which is our, 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 our one of our main drivers here, is, is our direct-to-provider channel, which is called our Clover Assistant. So it's a provider-facing application or, or, or doctor-facing application. Uh, so when one of our members goes to see a doctor in our network, that doctor can use this application to see potential conditions that they may not be aware of and then get clinical recommendations following clinical standards of care. So the main challenge is then our first, like how can we talk about all of these different interventions in different channels in one coherent way for the doctor? And then how can we optimize these interventions at scale? So this is a very high level overview of the architecture of our intervention delivery system. So remember, intervention delivery system is to intervene and deliver this intervention on their health before it becomes too bad. That way we can keep them healthy and lower costs on their health insurance. So first we have all our different sources of data, which feeds into our data warehouse. So this includes insurance claims data, which tells us procedures, diagnoses from medical visits, labs data, survey data, so on and so forth. Then data engineering and data science, we work together to make that into useful information, which then gets shipped over into our applications database. So we can do things like predict likelihood of diabetes or likelihood to lapse on their medication regimen. It's all really cool stuff. So this data gets fed into our recommender services, which is built by data science and engineering together to actually figure out who 
what and when based on the data fed in by this applications database from before. All of this gets serviced to the various streams of our front end, whether it be our corporate assistant, our member outreach, whether that be in, in, in the screen you saw before or whether it be in Salesforce or to our different Care Connect providers, this will all go and, you know, that will go and visit our patients. So all of these recommenders, they all feed these different channels. And then finally, we have some form of structured data capture that sends all this information back to us. So whether the intervention actually happened, what was the outcome, and then all of this comes back to the data warehouse for processing. So this is Python and we love Python. So we're a Python shop. We run all of this on Google Cloud Platform, data processes, batch jobs. They're all scheduled using Airflow. Python is used by data scientists to train the machine learning models, build recommenders. Uh, we use Django, it's REST framework for our API services. So a lot of this stuff that I mentioned just now, it's, it sounds really cool. And we, can, and we can dive into some of the cool algorithms and we can, that we use to build some of our decision trees to suspect medical diagnostics and stuff like that. But Unfortunately, much of this stuff is quite proprietary. And I don't, I don't want to get us into too much trouble by you know, giving out too many trade secrets in this talk. So I want to define something a little bit more safe to talk about, as well as something that I think each and every one of you can implement in your own company. Because um, every company has a website, every company has web applications. So maybe let's get into what we're actually here to talk about, which is in two words is building websites. So more specifically, uh, building self-managed public facing web applications. So self-managed, what does that mean? So we're a fairly large company. We got marketing got operations, we got clinicians, we got doctors. We're not just technologists. Even though we're a health tech company, we're not all coders, right? Not everybody here can code. So we can save engineering manpower and build out things for our website content managers to be self-reliant and empowered. So how do we do that? So oftentimes I think people think company websites are like just a single monolithic application where you just sell what you do, right? But as most of you probably know, that's not always the case, right? Um, so there are two things that I want everybody here to take away from this talk. If you, if there's just two things that you can take away from this is we don't want engineering to make content changes on our website as little as possible. We want to, you know, pass that ownership over to content managers, marketing, uh, business operations, anybody on that side of it. Anybody who is not really making decisions on what goes on the website should not be like engineering. We don't make those decisions, right? So we shouldn't be the ones that have to make those changes. We should allow the people that make those decisions to make the changes themselves, number one. And number two, we also want to allow for engineers to access and build out new tools really easily on the website. So we all need a comfortable stack. So regarding this comfortable stack, I've worked on you know websites in pure bootstrap, HTML, I've used Wix, I've used WordPress, Vue, and I've even tried building something out in, in Salesforce's uh, CMS. And I have to say that the best balance so far has been with Django CMS. It allows for like content management independence, as well as a really cool, you know, cool engineering, cool stack that, um, you know, I mean, many content managers might prefer Wix or WordPress, but how many of you here have enjoyed building things out in, in that? It, it, this is PyCon, so I know I personally haven't enjoyed it. So it's all about finding that balance. And here at Clover, we have found it with Django CMS. So, yeah, um, how many of you here have, <laughs> quick raise of hands, you know, to yourself. How many of you here have used Django? I know I have. It's uh, probably one of the most popular web frameworks for Python users. Uh, it's really fast, really secure, scalable, but you guys can read this on the company website. Django CMS, show of hands, if you can. Who's used Django CMS? Or who's ever even heard of Django CMS before? Probably not very many of you, right? It's, um, it's a little niche, but I think it's great. Um, but this is, this is their official tagline. You can read this on their company website. So in, 
for me, um, I just look at Django CMS as just another Django plugin. So you can literally go on, you know, the Django admin, and after you install Django CMS, based on their documentation, you'll see it right there. It's just literally another Django plugin. It's built around the needs of multilingual publishing by default. So all websites, pages, and content can exist in many, many multiple language versions, as you can see on the right part of this slide. So I'm sure many of you here build websites in Asia that need to cater towards English and Chinese audiences. So uh, Django CMS is built out specifically for that. So let me just give you a quick demo uh, of what it looks like. So here, um, when you are in Django CMS, when you're logged in as a CMS user, so this is uh, Django, this is our website. So you can click on edit here. And as a content manager, you can literally just go through here and you can double click on anything and you can just update, update the text and you can drag and drop things around. Here's the structure mode. This is the structure bar. And if we wanted to move this hero down to the bottom of the page, we can literally just do that. And then here she is down here. So let's move her back. It's just as simple as dragging and dropping these things around. And you can also publish pages. And here we have English and Spanish because you know we're a US company, so a lot of people there speak Spanish. And we can have published versions of English pages and non-published versions of Spanish pages. You see with the green and the gray dot. And you can put things in the menu. You can publish pages, create pages. All of the management, all of the content management is in the hands of, uh, not, <laughs> of not the engineer, which is what we want, right? We don't want engineers to go in there and type, it, type out HTML to, to change, change text, right? So we want to give this into the hands of the management. So that's just what it looks like um, from a content management perspective. So let's go back here. So since um, since all of us here, I assume, are more tech, you know, more more tech wizards, more engineers on this side, um, I think what I want to talk about is how to set this up so that we can empower our content managers to be able to create however they like. So since we are all engineers, let's dive a little bit into how Django CMS works, what's going on under the hood. So here's a little high level overview of what's going on here. So the core application is built on Django, like I told you, and it's just a plugin, uh, Django CMS on top of Django. It pulls from the code base with all the CMS plugins. Uh, so before I, uh, get into a little bit further, I just wanted to just clarify a CMS plugin is literally any one of these things. So this here is a CMS plugin. So they have Django CMS plugins that are, you know, that comes with it. You can like download different plugins through templates. Um, but here at Clover, we, we built our own because we have to be compliant with, um, with, with the elderly. They, you know, we have to have text like a certain size it has to be, uh, it's called, it's called the central Medicare services compliant, CMS compliant. So that's why we have to, uh, build out all our plugins ourselves. And it also creates for much more flexibility. So that's what a plugin is. So it pulls, um, plugins. Uh, we also pull our Django application logic, our model view template, uh, optional translation files. Uh, we use a package called Rosetta, which pulls from these .po files with just a bunch of translations on them. Um, and of course, our JavaScript, CSS, etc. All right, and then we also have to connect to a database, right? So Django CMS is just like Django, it's agnostic. It can even have NoSQL, but it's unofficially supported. Uh, but in general, we use Postgres here at, uh, at Clover. So we have our basic Django application tables, of course, uh, because this integrates very well with Django. Uh, so based on the Django apps and models that developers might define, uh, we also have our built-in CMS plugins as well as any custom plugins that we might create. So every plugin, like I showed you before, we register in the code base and it usually needs to have a model associated with it. 
So here is that, uh, so right there on the left, you see, so that every instance where the plugin gets used by your content manager creates a row in the table of that specific CMS plugin. So that's a query of the, the plugins in the back end. So, so Django Filer is a file management application for Django. Um, it handles uploading or organizing files and images, and they'll store the location URLs of where these uploaded files are from them so that we can serve them easily. And here you can see that the image IDs, they're used as foreign keys in our CMS plugins. They point to the filer storage locations, which have their own um, super type, subtype relationship with uh, a filer object. All right. So these filer objects, they point to assets on the cloud. Uh, that's where we serve them from, either GCS or S3. And then they serve them through the, uh, the web server gateway interface. To, to All right, so that's the infrastructure. Now that we understand a bit about under the hood of what the CMS is doing, we can get to the, the real fun part, the, the power that can be unleashed by building your own custom CMS plugins to create that really nice identity for your own website and to give this power to your content managers. So these are your plugins. Building out these reusable components or plugins uh, allow for flexibility and creative independence by your content managers, which can also be restrictive to color palettes and CSS, like I mentioned before. So the basics of building a custom CMS plugin are actually quite simple. So let's dive into that one I was just showing you. It's, this one is called Hero. It's our, our, you know, it's our Hero plugin. So here's the code. Um, really simple, surprisingly simple. So we got our Python decorator that registers our plugin at the top there. And we add this to our settings. Uh, so here's our the CMS placeholder conf. It's in our uh, Django settings file. So we just register it there. And here we're inheriting from a standard CMS plugin base class that has just basic functionality of rendering the plugin, saving it to the database, caching, etc. So we named the plugin Hero. It's part of our growth module. Here, as when you load it up here uh, on the right, like if I loaded it up here, if I wanted to add a new plugin right here, so if I look up Hero, you see it, it's under our growth module. Right, it's very simple, very nice, right? This is our model. So we define a model which defines a table in our database where instances of this plugin will live. So if you're familiar with Django, the model defines the fields that the plugin will have. And here it inherits from a couple of abstract classes that add additional functionality, so images and call to action. Um, and here on the right, um, if you're familiar with Django as well, which I see a couple of you here in the chat box are, which is great. Um, when you define a model, you need to create the migrations, which will translate your defined models to the database level. And here you can see the different rows that are created for this particular Django CMS plugin that are used to store the information that our content manager will type into. So obviously, not all of them have to be, you don't have to make any of these, uh, any of these fields required. You can have, have it to be null equals true. So they can give this flexibility to our content manager. So the HTML template defined here is the controller in our traditional MVC. Um, right here in Django world, we traditionally define it as MVT, so model view template and it contains the CSS and some basic front-end logic, like this. So as you can see, this logic is really basic and uses Django templating language surrounded by, which is like, uh, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with Django templating language, but it's like Jinja, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a templating language that allows very basic logic. Anything surrounded by curly braces describes, um, two curly braces describe a variable and this, this instance.heading, it, it's what stores what the content manager is going to type in. So here in the HTML template is where we define what the CSS, what the template is going to actually end up looking like. So building out a variety of these plugins gives us a lot of different options for content managers to use freely. Uh, 
fun fact, they can also code out some bootstrap or HTML and, and many of these. Just so if I wanted to hear, if I wanted a couple of these guys, uh, if I typed in, uh, sorry, not this one, but some of them, we allow them to actually type in like this one, maybe not, sorry. Some of these we allow uh, people to here you type in source. Here you can see that we can actually type in some really basic uh, strap HTML if their content manager so desires to do that. So where does the power come in? If we wanted some powerful plugins, so extending this previous plugin out, we can utilize some data power uh, using uh, some Django REST framework. It's actually really simple. Let me show you how. So let's look at the previous hero plugin that we were looking at, okay? So this is just another instance of that plugin. It's the same exact plugin. It's just our content manager decided to throw a different picture in it, put the picture to the right. It's, it's the same plugin, it's the same code that we define as uh, engineers for our content manager. So here we are having it, this is what it looks like before. And let's turn it into something like this. So what changed? Obviously we have a new name right under the same module called hero plan search but um let's look at the new model so this new model it looks like the only thing we added here was button text column this holds the values of the text for our button in our new zip code finding magic there are zip code finding magic so we want us to be able to press that button and search for plans in that zip code right so all our model does is just hold the text for that button. So no magic here, right? So it must be in the template. It must be in the render template, right? So let's take a look at that. So here, um, lots of logic is happening, but the main thing I want you to pay attention to is the form action right here. Let's go into that. So all of it, all it's doing is just basic HTML form that does a get request to an internal Django REST framework URL, uh, an absolute URL, sorry, an, a relative URL that's internal, that's that's all it's doing, it's just doing a GET request. So let's take a look at what this URL is doing. It's defined in our plans.urls.py, which is, if, as Django users, you understand that we can have different apps. Plans is our app here, um, and it's the urls.py, and here's our URL that is hitting. It's got a view that powers it, and let's, go through this view line by line a little bit to explain what it does. So here it's part of the template view that we're inheriting from, which is a basic Django template view. Um, and we're overriding the render to response function that will call our search plans. So here in our search plans, we get the user's input zip code um, from the get request and the hidden field that we calculated from the front end called the date. Um, we stick this into the API that gets the county data that is associated with that zip code from another internal API. We won't go into that. Here we flex the plan info from that uh, county ID using another internal API. And if we don't have it, we return just an, uh, a con we update the context with no plan information, which will redirect to a, a, a out of area lead form. Uh, otherwise, we, we update the context with um, zip code information and uh, plan information um, to, to do the magic for us, right? That's pretty much what we're trying to do. So let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at what it's doing, okay? So here, if we type in a zip code that stays 07002, which is a zip code in New Jersey, USA, we click on this, it's gonna hit that endpoint and it's going to render the plans that are in the zip code. So it was able to tell, we have four plans in your zip code in 2021, and here are the different plans. So cool thing about this is, um, the cool thing about Django CMS, because it's in Django, and a lot of us here at Clover are familiar with Python and familiar with Django, we can integrate a lot of different Django applications into this one you know, domain name service. We can integrate like this, integration integrate this enrollment form for instance like this entire enrollment flow which is a django session wizard view which automatically saves session data in our back end in sessions this is not part of the cms so it's really delineated towards for us um which is really great and then 
we have other applications inside of here. Uh, okay, um, another thing, like if I typed in like uh, 46825, which is Indiana, it will return a no plan, it's out of area. So here we're, we're just gonna enter this. And this page itself, believe it or not, is a Django CMS page. So it's using a plugin. So let me just go here to this page here when I'm logged in, Django CMS. So here, if I edit this as a content manager, I can, it's, it's really powerful. It's a form that creates a case inside Salesforce, a lead in Salesforce, a Salesforce so that we can track uh, people that are interested in us that are not in the area. And all of this information, it's a powerful plugin by CMS, by Django CMS, that our content managers can actually update. It's just really, really powerful, really nice. And it puts the, 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 it puts the responsibility and the ownership to the content manager, not the engineer. Uh, we also have uh, React forms that are directly built into this website as well, that integrate directly here. So here we have, you know, we can search for providers, like if I type in Danny, this is completely built um, in React and it integrates really nicely with our website. And here's all the different uh, providers, same Danny, that are in our, our, our network. Um, so it's, it's, it's really cool. It's a really cool tool to integrate and to give ownership to content managers. And again, um, I don't work for Django CMS, it's open source. That's basically what I wanted to talk about. So here's a summary of what I just talked about. I know it was fast and I'm running out of time, I know. But uh, many of the cool things that we do at Clover, you know, aren't represented with building plugins for content managers, of course. Just want to remind you guys that. But it's also a fun thing to do as well. You know, no deed is beneath any of us here. But I'll admit it is fun, you know, seeing features that you build that help save lives. That's also really cool to do. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions whatsoever, please. You can ask me right here, or you can type them in the chat, or connect, you know, with me on LinkedIn, send me an email. And, yeah, we're still hiring. We're, we're growing quickly. If Thanks, there are no Andy. questions, yeah, yeah no problem. No problem. So question. may I ask the participants? So if you have any questions, please type your question in chat or unmute your mic. Uh, Sorry if I talk too fast. I just had so much to share and I only have 30 minutes. So. Uh, yes, all right. Yeah, you can have a uh, three to five minutes Q and A, <laughs> including yeah. your assessment. It looks like uh, no questions. So I guess I'll sit here until uh, until the time runs out. And yeah. Have, uh, our next wonderful guest. Me too. One. Us. Any questions? Oh. We oh, just we got, got one question. Oh, yeah. Right. I encountered any bugs when using Django CMS? Well, I think uh, as an engineer, I think we all encounter bugs when using any <laughs> any tool, right? Um, but with Django CMS in particular, I would say that uh, if you are a lover of Django, the bugs that you will encounter are very, very similar to the bugs that you're going to find with Django. But in terms of using the interface of Django CMS itself, I haven't found very many that that, that are are too difficult to debug. So yeah, if, if anybody here is a Django user that enjoys Django and they want to build a, a website that is really easy to manage, Django CMS. It's good. Thanks for your question. Yes, friends standing. So any other questions? So if we don't have other questions in half minutes, we will we will just end this session here. Yeah. Stop sharing my screen.
five four three two one five four three three two one. Okay, it seems we have no no more questions. Yeah. So thanks, thanks, Danny. Very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So uh, we would like to thank uh, our former sponsor, Code for Health, Microsoft, and MySQL. And thanks our speakers and our volunteers. Yeah. So uh, so we just uh, finished uh, four, uh, four sponsor sessions, and we still have uh, two more sessions uh, at another soon links. So with you, uh, with, with you only uh, got the free tickets and, and you just uh, can access the uh, sponsor sessions, you can fill the post conference uh, feedback form. So you can, you can go to uh, bit.ly, PyCon, HK, Trendy, Feedback, or just scan the QR code. Um, you can also uh, post your sharing on your social network like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, it, well, uh, with the hashtag uh, PyConHK, PyConHK2020. Uh, um, this uh, promotions again, we still have a 20 T-shirt if you would like to purchase, uh, purchase uh, additional T-shirt, it's just uh, 100 Hong Kong dollars only. Just feel free to email to pycon at pycon.hk. Um, uh, uh, we just have a uh, opening speech and also uh, four uh, sponsor, uh, sponsor sessions from, from me. And uh, also from our sponsor uh, about the uh, MySQL shell with Python, uh, 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 develop a uh, correlative application with uh, MySQL, uh, uh, some Python debugging uh, uh, skills, uh, and, uh, and also the Django CMS, the M M is uh, West Wing as well. So uh, we still have uh, two other sessions, uh, which will be started from, uh, let me see, uh, uh, 5, 10 p.m. Hong Kong time. Uh, so it's about uh, 15 minutes later in uh, another uh, soon link. So you can check your email to find, find the second link. So we will have, uh, uh, to uh, data and machine learning related uh, topics. So we we will have um, a, we have about the time series data and also the uh, 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 monitoring for the machine learning. And the and the speaker just told me that uh, he just uh, have a have a something on his topic titles. Yeah, but the content is same. So we will see you soon. And, and, and other uh, soonings and and the uh, next sooning will be started uh, uh, now, I think, yeah, after I end this session, this sooning, yeah, so see you soon. Bye-bye.